we're starting that council where men and women can come to converse about the actual uh, coexistence of all people everywhere on this one planet and the necessity to see all of our sons as all of our sons, not just the black, the white, the big, the small, you know, the Muslim or the Christian, but they're all of our sons. And so I'm interested in that and passionate about that. All right, so for me, the wounded mother, um, came up this week and talking to a number of women about situations in their lives and how it ripples out into the world. So part of my own wounding and healing happened for me um, when my mom got sick when I was a kid. And, uh, and I remember at that time, and I've shared this story before, uh, that I found this pamphlet on our table for this place called Mejdegoria, where there was this blessed mother I, I was a Catholic. I went to Catholic school. I, I sat before a bloody crucifixion. I didn't get it. And in the corner, in the way dusty, dark corner, I saw the Blessed Mother and I thought, I want to know more about that. And why isn't that center stage? And so when I found this pamphlet to Mejdegori where you could go and see children who were having apparitions with the Blessed Mother, I was like, I want to go to there. And I knew that she was also, it said in the pamphlet anyhow, that she was healing people. And I was like, if I go, I could get my mom a healing. Anyway, my mom passed away. I moved into New York. As fate would have it, I got gifted a trip to Mejdegoria. But, and I did go there and I did heal my mom. But it wasn't my biological mom. It was my internal mom, my internal mother. And what happened was, I was um, we went up to the top of the hill in the middle of the night where everyone would meet with the children and they would have these apparitions of the Blessed Mother. And they would give us a message. And then we got to ask questions, just like here, we get to use our voice and get to ask questions. Up until that point, I was not encouraged to use my voice from the tribe that I came from. It was like, Maureen, stop asking so many questions. And so well, I felt nervous about raising my hand, but I raised my hand anyhow. And afterwards, they, they called on me. And the, the question I asked, and I asked because the talk was all about how the Blessed Mother was weeping, that we were being so disposable with our children. And I didn't have children at the time. And I didn't really relate to it too much, but I did feel guilty. So I asked the question and I said, does she ever laugh? And if so, what makes her happy? <laughs> and um, this woman kneeling next to me, she was like a billion years old and she looked up at me and she said, that's a good question, honey. And in that moment, little did I know how important it was to experience somebody encouraging my voice, encouraging my spiritual questioning. And it wasn't the night sky and it wasn't the kids seeing apparitions and it wasn't the Blessed Mother. It was this old lady next to me that healed me with this simple little gesture of saying like, good on ya. And that's how it gets healed. So a uh, one kind gesture, one nurturing nod changed my life. Uh, and from that kind gesture, a whole ministry grew because in that moment, and it rippled out for many years. I held on to that moment for many years, but I got to see why it was so important to me. It was so important to me because it was a moment that helped me find my voice. And so from everything on forward, it was all about me helping other people find their voice. So speak easy is about speaking about God easily. Voice box is about helping people tell their stories. Miracle of Life 365, it's all about like, what do you think? And I think this is part of the great healing that we're all going through, voice, visibility, and value. It's all about, you know, finding your voice, the part that you're here to play so you could show up and shine. And I know that sounds like so trite, but it actually is true. So that was a while ago, and the poem that April read was from the 1800s. I mean, we're still trying to figure out a way to find our voices and to find our mother voices. In the Bible, father is mentioned 852 times. Mother is mentioned 312 times. So it's hard to find her. You know, she's three times less available. In A Course of Miracles, father is mentioned 727 times. 727 times. Mother is mentioned once. <laughs> and although this is my book, man, it's still, it's hard to find the mother, you know? We have no stories, no resources, no examples, but virgins and whores. So how are we supposed to find ourselves? So happy Mother's Day. Here we are speaking about the wounded mother. And when it comes to mothers, you know, 
when it comes to essential workers, moms are the most essential workers that were ever put on the planet. Moms are the top of the list. Moms without moms, nothing would get done. So much goes into being a mom. If you get a kid past the finish line into adulthood, you should deserve a ministerial license, a doctorate, an Oscar, and a freaking vacation. But we don't get that, you know? Your moms are the real deal. We surrender our freaking bodies. We give our bodies over to another soul. We surrender our hearts, our plans, our agendas, our last penny. We surrender our sleep, our freedom. We literally give up our names. We're no longer April, Joni, Mary. We're, we're mom. That's it. We're mom or ma. That's it. And sometimes in the giving up of things, we give up our sanity. <laughs> uh, but here's the thing. Although we don't honor the mother in society, there is something so mystical and so majestic about being a mother and about mothering, about the energy of mothering, and not just the physiological idea of it, which I love, but you know, not just the idea of the conception and the gestation and the labor and the bloody show. These are things we don't even talk about. And the water breaking and the symbolism of actually giving birth, delivering life from life. I mean, this is audacious. And then once the baby is born, the caring that goes into another soul. And this isn't just like run of the mill type caring. This is freaking mother. This is like mother bear caring. This is the kind of caring where you would absolutely kill somebody in order to save that child. Like where th that's what it looks like. I mean, if you've ever experienced your own internal mother bear, it's, it's almost scary. Like, man, I, <laughs> as a mom, I remember when one of my kids got bullied, I wanted to go down to the parking lot and like take that other kid out. It's not sane. It's not sane. We love people past sanity. You know, that, that's why we sometimes appear crazy. You know, we get starstruck by this sweet little soul. We get absolutely starstruck. And back of all of this magnificence is this energy that's indefinable. It's just a palpable, powerful energy. And I don't think as a society, we have yet to scratch the surface on what it is to mother. And, but I will say that it's not for the meek and it's not without its marvels. And the mothering, the energy of the mother is not reserved for mothers who have given birth or who have adopted or acquired children. It's for everyone. Every single one of us, men, women, big, small, have the mothering gene. Because it's simply an, an expression of God. We don't always hear this though, because we hardly ever get to hear mother God. We always hear father God. So to nurture somebody, to protect, to mentor, to teach, to encourage, you become an advocate for somebody. You ask for things for your kids that you've never asked for yourself. That's how big that love is. The mom is the sure bet, the safety zone, the steady eddy, the springboard, the shoulder to cry on when things go south. The mom is the over-enthusiastic standing ovation of one. <laughs> you know, that's your mom. When, you, when you're the mom, you get out of bed in the middle of the night and you bring this little entity, you bring them water and you bring them books and you tell them stories and you soothe their worries and you blow their noses. And then you threaten them within a hair of their life. <laughs> It flips on a switch and you get out of bed in the middle of the night and you you go out in your pajamas with sleep in your eyes and you drive people places you drive people that you don't even know places you take people you're just like somebody's uber somebody's personal chef cleaning lady tutor life coach and and you're not you're not you're not qualified for these roles you've never been trained for these roles you've never been trained for all that you're asked to do but the good news is it doesn't matter because you're not going to get paid anyhow <laughs> <laughs> so most of the time as a mom, you feel completely confused, totally overwhelmed, a dollar late, a day short, riddled with guilt, and haunted by an extremely overactive, morbid imagination. And you do all the things that you promised yourself that you would never do. You know, you cry at Hallmark commercials and you melt down. You have meltdowns where you don't even recognize yourself. And you grow a great tolerance for sticky hands and wiping asses and noses and kissing boo-boos and bolstering broken egos. And surprisingly, you're, you're dazzled. Like you're generally, you're generally dazzled, and, dazzled and awestruck by first words and finger painting and knock-knock jokes. 
<laughs> and you find the tolerance to sit for like 30 minutes to hear once again the mundane details of the latest video game. I don't know where we find the strength. And on our good days, we recognize you know, how rare this beautiful opportunity is to see the world once again through the innocent eyes of a child. And although there's great effort and energy poured into this role that we play, somehow we would pay it twice and every day and forever. That's a mom. But there is the shadow side of the mother, caring for someone less powerful, caring for somebody more vulnerable than you is not always a romantic endeavor. And the relationship can be a landmine for misunderstandings and for trespasses. And it's really hard sometimes to see where you end and they begin. So when I was thinking about the wounded mother, I was thinking about the seven deadly sins, because this is a place, an obvious list of character defects that cause us to move outside of ourselves. So just basically places where we miss the mark because we don't believe in sin, but just like, you know, sideways um, character defects. So the seven deadly sins, um, which are not in the Bible, actually, they were given to us by the Desert Fathers. And the Desert Fathers were early Christian monks. And the list is pride, envy, gluttony, lust, anger, greed, sloth, uh, just, you know, seven lovely flavors of fear. In pride, we say, I'm better than you. In envy, we say, you're better than me. In gluttony, we say, there's not enough food. In lust, we say, there's not enough sex. In greed, we say, there's not enough money. And in anger, we say, you better listen to me. And in sloth, we say, I don't care about anything. And so I was looking over that list of the seven deadly sins, and I was thinking, I don't know, they don't work for me. Like, I don't, I don't really, they don't really ring true for me in a big way. And they felt more like wounded fathers than wounded mothers. So I tried to look again through a feminine version of these maladies. And, you know, these were given to us by the desert fathers. And I was craving to know what the desert mothers had to say. <laughs> but unfortunately, those voices were not recorded. Uh, I like to say in my writing groups, those who hold the pen hold the power. And what's left unheard will be left unhealed. So it's no wonder that the mother is wounded. It, it turns out that my contemplation of the wounded mother, um, that I did find that she might have a whole set of her own ailments. In place of pride, the wounded mother has martyrdom. New pride says I'm not worthy and I deserve more than this life. And the martyr says, I don't even deserve this life. I, I, I'm more valuable to you dead and I'll slip on my own sword to prove my unworthiness. And in place of rage, the wounded mother is silent with secrets and gossip. She says, don't ask, don't tell. And if you do tell, you know, don't tell them directly, talk about them behind their back. And that's the wounded mother. And in place of lust, the wounded mother has fragility, which makes sense because we are, you know, under the, the hypnotic, um, stories of the virgin birth, <laughs> you know, and uh, how sex is just regularly just interpreted from the male perspective, using sex as creation and not pleasure for women. And we are living under the fear of slut shaming and over sexualization of our images. So fragility would be natural when it's always about sex and only about sex. In place of gluttony, the wounded mother sees malnutrition and we measure out our meals and we raise our daughters on diets from day one. And that's what it looks like for the wounded mother. And in place of sloth, the wounded mother swings into multitasking, where instead of saying, I don't care about anything, she cares about everything all the time. And if she, if she doesn't care, then she's failed. So all of this rests on the wounded mother, the uncared for mother. And it's no wonder she grows bitter. So how do we heal the mother and how do we care for and nurture our internal mother? First of all, as always, forgiveness. Forgive your mom, you know, forgive your mom, forgive your mother in nature, forgive yourself for hating and devaluing 
your nurturing, the nurturing side of you. It's hard to understand all of the pain and grief that gets swept beneath the rug and the effort to be a mom or to nurture. The frustration that lives beneath the surface, the unexplored explored territories that have gotten usurped by the devotion to others and the inexplainable inequalities that we've been marinating in for the past millennium. The unnurtured power and potential that's been aborted by a society that vacillates between sexualizing and demonizing the feminine divine. This is a culture that devalues her worth, that questions her choice, and systematically silences her in witch hunts and their modern day witch hunts, and they go on all the time. It's no wonder she's not batshit crazy. So forgive her. Next, appreciate her. And not with cards and candy, but appreciate her as you would an individual, a human being, a well-faceted human being, not an asexual robot whose only plan is to serve you. <laughs> That's not it. See your mom as human. To heal your own mother wound, learn to nurture yourself and remind yourself that your own self-care is a gift to everyone. You know, if mom is not happy, nobody's happy, but that's a saying, but that's actually true. Like you're responsible for your internal happiness and it comes from being nurtured. Next is value the mother. And this direction can be hit on many levels. You know, celebrate and appreciate the role that mother has played in our world and in our society, not just today, but as a daily practice. You know, 20 years ago in a church in Los Angeles, I was 30 years old when I heard the phrase, Mother, Father, God. And a cold sweat washed over me as I waited for thunder to crack and the world to break open and swallow us all for this blasphemous statement. That's how I felt at the time. I never heard the word Mother, God put together. And I felt like it was a dangerous oxymoron that we would all go to hell for. <laughs> That's the truth, man. That was, that was when I was 30. Do not let your daughters wait until they're 30 before they hear the phrase mother God. To heal the mother and the mother within you, listen to her secrets and trust that she's speaking the truth. To heal your inner mother, share your truth and trust that the world can handle it. To heal the wounded mother, understand that she's a sexual being and that's how you got to be here. Your mom had sex, that's it. That's how we all got here. So don't sex shame and don't think it's a secretive thing. It's a beautiful thing. Find a healthy balance between frigidity and whore. There's, as they say, 50 shades of gray between those two poles. <laughs> I don't know that they actually say that. I just said that now for the first time I'm hearing that myself. <laughs> so, um, so heal your mom, see her, see her, see the mother in all shapes, in all sexes, in all sizes, in all genders, accept her curves and her cycles as beautiful, as beautiful. Feed her well, not just her body, but her soul, her mind, her artistic endeavors, invest in her. To heal the mother, let her be, just let her be. Like stop pushing her past the pace of peace into productivity, let her come in grace and learn for yourself how to let go. All of us at this time are waking up and crawling slowly out of a deep unconscious sleep or nurturing is slowly, slowly being understood and valued and appreciated. We do get more bees with honey. It is easier for us to activate conversations in love as opposed to defense. We have spent so much money on a defense program and not a cent on a program of compassionate peace and communication. And it would do so well if we invested in that, at least on an individual way. So know for sure that your apple didn't fall far from your mom's tree, you know? That life has a way of returning ourselves to ourselves, to heal ourselves. The leash is long, but it's not without an end. So eventually we always come back to us. This is the laboratory, the sanctuary, the fun house, the asylum, this is it. And as we step into ownership for our healing, we can heal the world. Often the relationships that we have with ourselves and the world is a direct relationship with how we were mothered. 
And so no matter how you were mothered, no matter how you were mother, mothered or not mothered, if you were mothered by anyone in any way, shape, or form, just know that that woman, as best as she did, she was dealt a toolbox of rusty and unsupported tools. So forgive all of that and celebrate her passion and celebrate her wisdom and celebrate her resilience and her tenacity and her goals and her dreams and her choices and her voice and her power and her moxie and her strength and her compassion and her humanity and her humanness. I wanna close with this piece from A Course in Miracles because I told you that mother was mentioned once in A Course in Miracles. So I think we should know where it is. <laughs> um, it's uh, from, it's from uh, the manual for teachers under the classification of terms. It's in a section called ego and the miracle. It says, and it's talking about the ego and how ego and fear has led us into this place of, you know, destruction and defense and separation. And so it's saying like, you could have a miracle instead. It says, look at this kindly world you see extending before you as you, you walk gently. Look at the helpers all along the way you travel, happy in the certainty of heaven and the surety of peace. And look an instant too on what you left behind and finally passed by. This was the ego, all the cruel hate, the need for vengeance, the cries of pain, the fear of the dying, the urge to kill, the brotherless illusions and the self that seemed alone in all the universe. This terrible mistake is what you're healing. This terrible mistake about yourself, the miracle will correct as gently as a loving mother sings her child to rest. Is not a song like this what you would hear? Would it not answer all your thoughts to ask and even make the questions meaningless? I love that. <laughs> And that's the word, my friends. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Maureen. Oh my God. That's so good, Maureen. Feel that every word of it. Yeah. All right. Um, so for our meditation, I'm gonna do this song hymn to her. Oh. Your keyboard? Yes. Let me inside you into your room. I've heard it's like with the things you don't show. Lay me beside you down on the floor. I've been your lover from the womb to the tomb. I dress as your daughter when the moon it comes round. You be my mother when everything's gone. And she will always carry on. Something is lost and something is found. They will Keep on speaking her name. Some things change, some stay the same. Keep beckoning to me from behind that closed door. The maid and the mother and the crone that's grown old. I hear your voice coming out of that hole. I listen to you and I want some more. I listen to you and I want some more. And she will always carry on. Something is lost, something is found. They Keep on speaking the name. Some things change, some stay the same. Let me inside you.
into your room. I've heard it's like with the things you don't show. Lay me beside you, down on the floor. I've been your lover from the womb to the tomb. I dress as your daughter when the moon becomes round. You'll be my mother when everything's gone. And she will always carry on. Something is lost, something is found. They will keep on speaking her name. Some things change. Some stay the same. She will always carry on. Something is lost, something is found. They will keep on speaking her name. Some things change, some stay the Gosh, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. I wish that song would last all day long. <laughs> I just wanted to stay in that song. <laughs> Why was that the most perfect song? Who wrote that song? What is that from? Uh, well, I know it because it was recorded by the Pretenders. Um, uh, the songwriter's name is Meg Keen. God bless her. Yeah. Stunning. Stunning. That is a song for the mother, written by the mother. You could feel it. You could feel it in the way you sang it, too. Thank you so much for being such a <laughs> spiritual musical jukebox. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do pass a virtual basket to continue to keep things flowing here. And, uh, you know, this is just a way for you to stay in the flow as well, knowing that God is your source. So I'll pass it to you, Pam. Okay. I want to thank you all for being here with us today. And it means so much choosing to spend your Mother's Day with us. So thank you. And as Maureen said, part of our service is to pass a virtual basket to honor the law of giving and receiving. Um, and it helps us good, do good things in our community. And it helps bring Maureen's message of love to you each week. So as we learned in our 3B class on Friday, um, Tithing is a practice of remembering that God is our source. And our source is not our employer, our spouse. The way that we remember God is our source by tithing our time, our talent, or our treasure. And we give these things where we experience the God. So if that happened for you here today um, and you were moved to tithe, um, I put the link and the phone number in our chat window. And if you need any help with any technology, I also put my name and phone number and you can feel free to um, text me or call me at any time. And I, I would like to go off script here for just a second and say that, um, you know, this community mentioned that we have things coming up, educational opportunities coming up. And um, I've, I've met so many of you here in these classes you know, I met Keely in our prayer class. I met Beth at a writing retreat. I met Robina at our Miracles Live 365 call. Um, and I've some really good friendships. And like I was telling Maureen in the beginning, I drove to Shannon's house last night. She's in her 3V class. And so, you know, there's a wealth of wonderful people in this community. And these classes are a way to tap into these people and to get to know them. And, and it's just such a gift to me. And I would like to with you so that it can be the same for you. So with that, I'll close. Thank you.
Thanks. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I know I've met a lot of people at voice box too, you know, when you're sitting in a more intimate circle, it's just, it, it, you know, you can just go a little bit deeper and be more seen too. So that's the nice thing about those classes. Well, thanks for going off script. That was great.